We'll now go on to uh, questions and comments. I'll take questions and short comments. Can I ask that uh, now we have a couple of roving microphones uh, who I think we're going to have one in each uh, stairway. And could I ask that you wait until you have a microphone in your hand before you speak because if you try to speak without a microphone, we will not hear you. Um, okay, so um, let's, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, Ben Tyler. Just one quick comment on the last speaker. The, uh, I'm, I'm 57, so I've bought houses and sold houses. I've gone through a few cycles. Uh, two things. One is, in addition to the threat of being the foolish person who buys a Docklands flat at £700,000, it, it also, how that system works is that if you're the lucky person who buys a house in 1994, then you might be able to buy a five-bedroom house for the same price as a three-bedroom house a few years before. So it does work both ways, and that's why some people set themselves up to run vulture funds waiting for the crash. I just wanted to add to that that in my own experience, there is a sort of Judas statistic. In my experience of buying and selling things over the last 45 years, whenever UK house prices rise by 13% or more, there comes trouble. And that has been very clear for me, and I have followed that personally. Thank you. Should I respond on that? Um, briefly. Uh, I think you talk a lot of sense there. Uh, although I'd like to be able to give advice to Warwick grads about how to make money or avoid losses and so on, I, I don't view that as my main task or our main task. I, I think the role of economists is surely to figure out a system to try and smooth some of these incredible peaks and troughs. And although you're absolutely right, some people have been enormous winners and others enormous losers. Those things are essentially serendipitous. They go with particular cohorts of generations in what you might think of as a, an extremely unfair, unjust way. Uh, but that, that's all I'd like to say. Okay, we have, thank you. We have a question over here. And I see a gentleman in the middle and up there. I just want to ask uh, you as economists, do you have any way of taking into account money coming from illegal activities? Because, uh, for example, people now lose their jobs, lose their houses. They might resort to buying more drugs, even though it sounds funny, but it may be the case. And uh, with house prices and all the prices going down, would it be, uh, for example, the UK and other Western countries could be attractive uh, places for money laundering and buying things at discounted prices? It's, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, one, and there are two ways of, of thinking about answering that. One, one is about, as you say, money laundering or you know, financial um, scams and so on. You, you're more likely to see financial scams uh, on the up than, than on the way down. You know, Bernie Madoff, Ponzi schemes, that sort of thing. The other is about um, uh, black market, or what we call the black market, what they call the, the unofficial economy or something like that. And one would expect to see an expansion of that over the, next, over the next few years, I would have thought. And do you think that this can help uh, overcome the vicious circle the, of uh, you know, banks not being able to lend money? And if you have money from this black market, you know, to sort of I don't, I, I, don't, I don't see that would be very significant, not for the UK anyway, not for a major economy or any of the major economies. Thank you. Okay, so I saw a gentleman in the middle. It's uh, going to be hard to get to, but... Raise the hand. May I? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, good evening. And my question is, uh, I would like to come back on this uh, topic of macro prudential regulation and how can it work and... Uh, how, is it going to be effective when we know that uh, financial institutions take off balance sheet uh, positions and it's uh, it's so, the so-called uh, and the so-called um, uh, shadow banking system thank you okay so um, the macro prudential idea or one one type of macro prudential regulation I suggested was that um, you could combine inflation targeting, say, with um, changing capital adequacy ratios. So 
the idea would be that, that the central bank and the, uh, the financial regulator get together. They decide, and this is quite tricky stuff, but you know, they, could, they, they decide on uh, a level of growth of assets, of bank assets, that they think is consistent with the, with the, um, with the inflation target. And if banks' assets grow in value above that, that would raise the capital adequacy ratio. If it grows in, in less than that, then they, they shrink the capital adequacy ratio so you can lend less or you, liquidity grows less in a boom and is choked off in a recession. Now, your point is, well, um, well, I, well I, I, I infer that you're, you're, you're making several points. One is how do you, how do you regulate that? How, you know, where, where does the regulation come from? And I guess in the absence, I don't see us having a, a supranational um, regulated, it would be more or less, you know, regulations are made by bodies like the, the Bank for International Settlements uh, and they are implemented nationally and then they are, there's some sort of surveillance of those, of those measures by national and international agencies. The, you, your point though about the, the, the size of the, of the shadow banking or off-balance sheet activity is, which is I think the third point I'm inferring, is that uh, a lot of banks may not, or a lot of financial institutions may not be, may not be governed in that fashion. And that, I think, is, um, is, is, is a very important point. And that, you know, I just suggested one broad brush measure, but that broad brush measure would have to be uh, supplemented by fleshing out exactly what financial institutions are, what their definition is, and how they're subject to that regulation. So, yes, I take your point, but it, and it's not an easy one to solve, but it's one that will and, and uh, it should and will be addressed, I hope. Marcus. Um, yes. In, in, in the great, at times of the Great Depression, um, the, the Roosevelt administration addressed this sort of issue. And what they did is they banned banking, uh, the banking, commercial banking, from taking investment style uh, positions. It was a separation of investment banking from commercial banking. Um, and this was designed to, as it were, make commercial banking safe. Unfortunately, this was repealed in 1999 under the Clinton administration. And um, in my view, we need to reassert that separation. Uh, I think the activities of commercial banking are just too important. And the problems of monitoring um, people who are responding to the kind of incentives and the herd behavior that Andrew described are so great that we simply have to keep them separate. Uh, John Kay of the Financial Times uh, thought that possibly um, Obama had found the solution. You cap the bonuses, which means anyone who wants to make a ton of money stops being a banker in a, or in a commercial bank. He goes somewhere else. And this means commercial banks will be run by people who just want to do a proper job of taking commercial uh, deposits and lending them on to people who want to borrow. So I, f I feel the separation of commercial banking from investment banking is crucial. And secondly, it seems to me for, for investment banking itself, transparency is going to be terribly important because the Lemons problem says that you, if people are allowed to keep things off balance sheet, then no one in the industry will know who's cheating and who's not. So the very good will be swamped by the free entry of the very bad. So it seems to me it's in the interest of the hedge fund industry and private equity to not hide behind a lack of transparency. That way leads to uh, the fall off the edge of the cliff. Thank you. Now, there's a gentleman here, and after that, lady on the stairs, that's you, Anita, and then gentleman right at the back, uh, at the top of the stairs over here. So, you first. I'd like to hear the opinion of the panel on the question of marking to market, which uh, hasn't come up uh, somehow. But I think it's relevant to all three, because on the one hand, it increases herd behavior, and it's it's a, it's, it's extreme form of transparency, actually. Uh, well, it's, it's the definition of transparency in some sense. It fails in the case of uh, market for lemons, right? So because when there's no, in, in a fairly obvious way, perhaps, I mean, if it's not, then I'm sure the panel will make sure, may, will make clear why it is. And on the other hand, how it affects the solution that, that Mark is proposing in the sense uh, of, of uh, providing a, a, an instrument for, for, for policy. Perhaps I can begin to answer that. So, um, for the non cognoscenti, let me tell you a little bit what marking to market means. It, just, it means that, um, so remember I talked about capital adequacy ratios. So you looked about the value of the bank's balance sheet and you had to have a certain amount of capital to, uh, to, to back a certain amount of loans. Now, what happens if your assets are 
priced in the market regularly. Right, they're priced in the market daily. Uh, that in mark to market, in other words. So when there's a collapse of a bubble, suddenly your balance sheet shrinks. Right. If you're, that's to say, you know, say if you were, another way of doing it would be to um, value your assets on a 12-month moving average, say, something like that. In which case, if it's a, if it's a dramatic fall today, the, it'll be smoothed a little, right? But if, if it's not, if it's actually marked to market, they're priced exactly what the current market rate is. If there's a sudden drop, bursting in a bubble, then that will create a sudden reduction in your, in your assets, which means you've got to rein in lending extremely quickly. And that's why this, the bursting of the bubble was exacerbated, because lending had to be constrained very, very quickly, because the marking to market need to maintain capital adequacy ratios. And clearly, there's a flaw in the system, right? That, that, that cannot be right. Um, you know, there's a danger when you say, well, you shouldn't mark things at their market price, right? The alarm bells start to ring inside any economist's head. Um, but the problem is how you, how, you, how, you, how you price things fairly, how you avoid volatility, and how you, uh, how you, how you counter bubble behavior and bubble bursting behavior. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy issue. Again, it's one that needs to be addressed with something like smoothing over time or some other issue. But certainly, certainly um, marking to markets, I think, is, uh, has been largely to blame or partly to blame or contributed to exacerbated the, uh, the present crisis. Marcus. Uh, if I can just add to that, um, I agree with what Mark just said uh, by quoting two people. One is Walter Badgett, who, who was the person who recommended the Bank of England should stabilize the financial system by lending to banks. And he did say that uh, they should have collateral to offer for the loan, but that collateral should not be, be valued at the panic price. He recommended looking at a price somewhere between the panic mark-to-market price and the normal price. So that's the first qualification. The second was Hyun Shin in his lectures that I already quoted from, uh, in which he said that you should think of assets as, as wine, fine wine. They should be held to maturity and, and valued as such. You should look for the sort of maturity value of the asset, not its panic value. So I think I do agree with Mark. You get this excessive overreaction inside the system. And if you use that to value all the, everything at, at the time, the system will collapse. And the only solution is essentially bankruptcy. I think that's overdoing it. We need to have some other accounting system. I'm not sure I'm going to respond exactly to that, if you'll forgive me. But I would like to say one thing, and it follows on from an idea Marcus just gave me. In, in case it's not in completely obvious to everyone here, maybe it is, why did we have to rescue the banks and with these staggering bailouts? The reason is that the pound notes that are passed around by these institutions are the very stuff of regular life. That's why when a, even a very important car company is going to go bust or an airline or something very influential, we can allow the company to go bust because the very fabric of how we live is not affected. It might be inconvenient. We might have to buy a different kind of car from abroad or whatever. But uh, money, the stuff passed around by banks, the loans that in interconnect us all, that's the fabric of modern economic life. And I, I do share what I take to be the view that it's not sensible in our society to have the fabric of economic life run by people trying to make speculative gains. I don't necessarily blame them as individuals, but we, the role of a banking system is uh, just to keep us all going. So somehow or other, as the dust settles over the next five or ten years, we need to bear in mind that banks are different from other kinds of corporations. We need to get back to that. Anita. Yes, on the herding behavior, um, I'm just interested, how can we harness that to use it to get banks lending again, to get people spending again, to get people, you know, Andrew, you've got to have yes. some ideas. I wish I, had, I wish I had a solution <laughs> there. Uh, I mean, the, the upside is that the, the herd will, will catch up with the first people who swing. That's just the nature of it. If we can get a few people running away from the cliff, then most others will follow. Um, you could try and create so-called focal points, which I take it the government was trying to do in its, uh, it had a sort of deal where uh, on a certain date there'd be a tax break coming in or out and so on. But I, I'm afraid I haven't got a magic solution 
uh, to this. I wish I did. Forgive me. Perhaps I can not, not give you a magic solution, but, but contribute to, to your answer. I mean, one, one way of thinking about um, this, it's, a, it's, it's slightly akin to herding, is to think of um, the problems in the financial markets at the moment as a coordination failure. That's to say that the banks really would like to start lending, right? Because the sooner they start lending to one another, they get liquidity going, and they get, uh, get the system working again. That's what they would like to do. But they can't do it unless everybody else does it at the same time, right? So everybody has to come into the market and do it at the same time. So there has to be some kind of coordinating mechanism. Um, you know, over time, confidence will grow and liquidity will be added and that will sort of self-coordinate. But just getting them moving at the moment is very difficult. That's why, you know, I, um, I'm not saying uh, quantitative easing will be, will be the magic bullet, but it may be one way of, of coordinating behavior, you know, putting liquidity into those corporate bond markets and getting the, getting the markets working again to add some degree of liquidity, some degree of confidence, so that people have the confidence to, to enter the market together. Plus, you know, the central bank acting as a, a coordinating signaller and saying now is the time for, the, for us to get back together. But that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem in financial markets because they're based upon confidence. It's a confidence game. As soon as everybody loses confidence, you, you completely dries up. You have this coordination failure. But one way, one way would be one way is um, is to provide you know, some degree of deposit insurance, for example, which schemes have been talked about. Perhaps some quantitative easing to add liquidity to the markets. Um, and general, a general, and again, I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment later. But fiscal stimulus in the economy to 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 to, to try and uh, get the economy moving and uh, ameliorate the uh, the recession. Uh, Mark mentioned deposit insurance. Uh, I would add loan insurance. There is a book by, coming out by Alistair Milne called the, call, called the Fall of the House of Credit, in which he very strongly recommends what the government's already partly doing, which is to offer, at fairly cheap rates, uh, insurance for lending by the banks. And the argument is, if this, is, if this works, it'll be self-fulfilling. It shouldn't cost a lot of money. It'll encourage banks to lend because someone else will pay the cost if, if the loan doesn't work out. And if they, if they all then start lending, we may have solved the coordination problem that was referred to. So the notion of government guarantees for banks to lend, I think would, I would add to Mark Taylor's list. That's, could, could we take three of you in a row, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back to the panel. So the gentleman at the top, the gentleman in the grey jumper, and I'm not quite sure who's going to be next. Right. Uh, okay, so the, the gentleman at the end of the row, I think it was about a third of the way down. So please go ahead. Um, yes, I've just got a couple of questions on what Mark was saying. Um, the first is trying to build, trying to, I think you mentioned trying to bring together monetary policy and regulation. I mean, surely that's what the regime with the Bank of England regulating before the FSA. And the second point was on prudential regulation, if you like. We mentioned capital adequacy ratios as being the main focus. But the other part of prudential regulation is looking at the large exposures between banks. And it appears as though they were completely ignored and the kind of systemic risk, which perhaps you could have predicted in hindsight, um, was, if you like, ignored. So perhaps they did have the data, but chose or ignored it. That's my question. Thank you. Now, I'm afraid we're all going to have to remember that for a moment, and we'll go on to the next questioner, uh, you, sir. Hi. First of all, I would like to thank you for the fantastic um, presentations. And uh, I have to admit, I'm not an economist. I'm here to educate myself. Uh, sorry about that. I have three, three main questions. <laughs> for me. um, you don't have to remember could, that. Could, you yeah. might need to decide which is the most important, because uh, as you can see, a lot of people want to come into the discussion. Uh, currently, I think that in terms of in terms, you mentioned in terms of regulation, and but nobody, I, I haven't heard any of you three saying anything about the role of the credit uh, of the of the rating agencies and what uh, what uh, is their purpose? Because I would have thought that uh, their purpose is exactly to inform the investors of what is the quality of uh, of the investments they are about to make. So, and I would have think that they didn't do the job quite quite well. Second is uh, that there's currently a struggle between economies in terms of Europe and the US as the way that the currency is being fluctuating. We're seeing the dollar being uh, strengthened quite a lot recently. Which do you think are the main factors influencing 
the outcome of that struggle. And last, and the shortest question, what's next for capitalism? I think you may have heard that a lot. Thank you. Okay, and now I'm not quite sure who's got the microphone now, but okay, uh, go ahead, sir. The last speaker spoke about the nature of human nature, the nature of human activities, and how they think and how that actually affects bankers. How do you think the changes in and the changes in the laws affecting bonuses in the UK and the US is likely to actually, in practice, affect the activities of bankers and other people involved in the financial services sector? Okay, so let's uh, do a quick run around those questions. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what is the right order. Should we start with Mark again? Um, yes. Sure. Sorry, um, sure. remember all the questions, but um, one question was about FSA. The, so the Financial Services Authority, which oversees banking regulation, which was separated from what well, regulation used to be part of the Bank of England, was separated from the Bank of England uh, about 10 years ago or so. Um, yes, I mean, I think that probably was a mistake. I agree, because it's in a, degree, in a way um, removed a degree of transparency, removed a degree of closeness between um, the bank and the regulatory authorities, and um, I think that might be something that we looked at again. Um, I think there was an issue about um, interbank balances and could we have monitored those? And it's not really just, in, the problem is not just interbank balances, so it's, you know, so uh, hedge fund balances, for example. Now, how do you know what kind of positions hedge funds are taking? We could, there could be some monitoring in the over-the-counter market, I suppose, but it's very, very difficult to, to, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and over-regulate, right? Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult issue, issue to, 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 to approach, but I, I, you know, I, I can see where you're coming from. The, the idea on credit rating, did our credit rating agencies to blame? Yes, of course. Um, but again, as in anything in economics, it's all about incentives, right? What were the incentives for credit rating agencies to go out on a limb? Uh, not much, right? They just basically, if, you know, if somebody's AAA, well, okay, we're AAA as well. So, you know, what, what might be an idea? Here's an idea. You could have um, credit rating agencies offered franchises. So you have three or four credit rating agencies in competition. Uh, and they are, um, they are they're offered franchises for a certain amount of time, five, ten years, and then they're judged on the basis of their performance over that period, and they're either, you know, continue to be hired or they're fired. And that would, that would create a, a greater incentive for credit rating agencies to try and get it right and not just follow the, follow, follow the herd, if you like, follow the pack. Um, this question about bonuses. Um, again, I think one, it, analyzing the issue on bonuses, it, there are a number of points one has to consider. Again, it all boils down to incentives. You know, so I'm all in favour, as a financial economist, all in favour of people having incentives to perform well and for being punished when they don't perform well. I think in this case one has to, when thinking about bonuses and the discussion in the, in the press, one has to try not to be too emotional about it, right? And think, well, what, what exactly what is this bonus? Is it something that you get that's extra on top of your pay, you know, Mr. Mr. you know, it's like Grace Brothers or something, Mr. Grace comes around, says you've done very well and gives you a, a packet of fivers or something like that. I mean, what we're talking about here really is variable pay. And I'm all in favor of variable pay and pay related to performance, right? But then, you know, for, for certain, certain areas of the, of the financial industry, it's quite clear that, you know, so the, the, um, the debate over um, Lloyds, for example, and whether, you know, people are average earnings of 18,000 pounds, in a branch somewhere, perhaps they should they have an extra 2,000 or 1,000 pounds a year. These are not large sums of money, but they're significant sums of money, and they are significantly affect those people's uh, their, uh, performance. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a problem when there becomes a disconnect between um, large amounts of money being paid to um, people who set the strategic direction of financial institutions that was clearly incorrect. And, um, and contributed to the crisis we're in. So, you know, these, these, these are very emotive issues, but at the end of the day, it really ought to be solved by thinking about incentives, thinking about rewards for performance, and thinking about, um, you know, realistic, uh, resetting, setting salaries at uh, realistic levels. Uh, I'm going to call on Marcus now, but just before I do so, uh, we're almost at our advertised uh, closing time. Uh, in view of the 
considerable interest in the hall. Uh, I'm going to extend until 7.45, but we will finish then on the dot. Uh, those of you who will not have got into the discussion by that point, I'm afraid we have to think of this as just a continuing discussion. But uh, Marcus, would you like to come back in now? Uh, on the question of what's next for capitalism, the short but pithy question, uh, I guess the answer is uh, a rolling back from the high watermark of uh, Mrs. Mrs. Thatcher and, and President Reagan. They said that um, government was not part of the solution, it was the problem. And uh, now we're turning to the government one time after another to see how to fix the problems created by the private sector. So the whole idea of uh, self-regulation or light touch regulation seemed to have triggered a race to the bottom as different um, financial centers competed in not regulating financial systems, in deregulating uh, the, the home uh, loan industry. So it seems to me that has to be reversed. Uh, so that, that's my short answer. I feel it's a, a shift back to a much more regulated position, um, largely because of the recognition of what Mark was just saying. Incentives are incredibly powerful. And if you put together strong incentives and asymmetric information, that can be held to pay. And I think the costs are enormous. I mean, we saw the kind of figures of the recession. Mark is saying he doesn't know what to tell the Prime Minister of Japan. These are the costs of having let go of controls on our financial system. And I agree with Andrew Oswald. We shouldn't do that. You know, the basic business of finance is too important to allow it to be used as a plaything for people who are trying to gamble. So my feeling is let's keep gambling out of the banking system. And the, um, that's about it for me. Okay, now I've uh, lost track of my cue, but there's uh, a gentleman in the middle wearing a greenish design on your T-shirt, and then uh, the gentleman uh, uh, in a grey jumper just in front of him. Okay, two rows down after that, and then uh, you, sir. So you're third. Um. Um, my question is regarding banking regulation. Um, it seems like to be the next miracle to save the world and not to prevent and to prevent further crises. Um, but just like Basel II was enacted, um, yet bankers found a way around it through derivatives and off balance sheet finance. Um, so is that really the way forward? And should it be rules-based or concept-based? Thank you. Um, uh, yes, let, let's take, take uh, you next, please. Thank you. And then, okay. Yes. Um, I've got a question about depression, but perhaps in the more psychological sense and the economic sense. Um, lo there's lots of experts out there, economists, think, you know, looking at the forecast for GDP going forward. But obviously, concurrently, the Stiglitz Commission, if I've got the name right, are looking on measures of uh, happiness and that will going forward. So, what well, my question is, is given this, what is the outlook for happiness going forward? And more importantly, is it pro-cyclical in relation to GDP, or is that a leading um, variable? And if so, what can policymakers who aren't in the financial sector, other policymakers, what can they be doing perhaps to promote general sentiment in the economy going forward? Okay, shall we change the order and start with Andrew? <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a great deal of evidence that happiness is pro-cyclical. In other words, it rises in booms and it declines in slumps. And unemployment is very closely correlated with uh, unhappiness and uh, mental strain and to some degree mental illness in the economy. So just as consistent with your common sense, surely, economic cycles really do matter for human well-being. And they're much more important than the sheer movement in the monetary aggregates. In other words, there's a lot of uh, self-esteem and uh, belief and confidence, whatever it is, wrapped up in these business cycles inside people's minds. It's not just about how high the pile of pound notes is. 
Uh, I'm afraid the outlook for, well, we know that the uh, happiness and mental well-being indicators are dropping sharply at the moment, probably because of the rising unemployment and the fear of unemployment. Marcus. Uh, on the question on Basel II, uh, as an example of regulation, I feel it's an example of regulatory capture. It seemed to me that Basel II basically said, whatever the big banks are doing must be good for everybody. But as has, been, as has been pointed out by both of my colleagues on the panel, often what's individually rational is not collectively sensible. So my, my feeling is that we mustn't, mustn't copy Basel II or take it as an example of good regulation. We must try to look at these systemic features uh, in, what, in what we do going forward. <coughs> Secondly, on the, uh, the question of um, asset prices and, and uh, are they efficient even in stock markets, um, uh, the answer is surely not. Uh, the whole st the dot com bubble was an example of, of uh, herd behavior, as Andrew called it. And um, at the time, it seemed as if the problem was partly that the central bank was underwriting your investments. Greenspan was known to be very uh, supportive of, of dot com. And when the bubble burst, some people were very angry with him. Why didn't he save us? So I think it's true that these, 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 these phenomena of herd behavior and apparent insurance infect not just housing markets, but also stock markets. Mark. Um, so I would echo Marcus's comments on uh, Baal II. Um, and the issue about, you know, it, uh, is this going to be a magic bullet that we introduce tougher regulation or, or macro prudential regulation, combine that with inflation targeting? I don't, no, I don't think so. I mean, you know, for 16 years almost, um, you know, we thought we'd reach monetary policy nirvana with, with inflation targeting. You know, and I was always a bit nervous because you know, I'm old enough to remember at least two other uh, periods you know, when we had Keynesianism and you just chose whatever point on the Phillips curve you want and, and that broke down. Then we had monetarism and that, you know, that, that was going to be the new saviour and that, that broke down. Uh, we had brief flirtation with exchange rate targeting. That didn't work. And then we had inflation targeting. And, you know, I was just waiting, quite frankly, as a cynical economist, to see, uh, to see when it when it would uh, show its so it show, show its shortcomings. So I think, but I think, you know, one aspect of the um, the framework I've suggested, combining macro prudential regulation of, of the financial sector with, um, with 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 inflation targeting, modifying inflation targeting, which has generally worked very well in, in most other areas, right? It's delivered us stable, low inflation and stable growth. Um, is a reasonable way forward. I don't think it's going to be the last word, but it's 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 a way of moving forward. And you say, well, you know, um, will regulation help us? No, well, you know, will, will medicine help us? I mean, people still get sick, but, you know, they get, they get sick and they get cured and they get less sick than they, and they live longer than they did 150 years ago because of advances in medicine. So as we advance our knowledge of the economy and improve our regulatory uh, capabilities combined with, um, with, with the policy framework, we'll make, make life better. We may not, we won't, we won't be perfect. The, idea, and the, the point about it, in, uh, market efficiency and PE ratios, saying PE ratios, that's the ratio of pr the price of a stock to its annual earnings, we're getting way out of kilter. Well, that's just another way of saying, it, in effect, that there's a bubble, right? Because really, what should you buy a stock for, for the earnings it's going to give you? If you're just buying it to sell it to someone else at a higher price, then you're, you're playing you know, what, what Keynes called a game of snap or old maid or some sort of competitive uh, sudden stop game, which is, uh, which is highly, uh, and that should, have been a, that should have rung a bell in these markets, the price earnings ratios, sorry, price, uh, yeah, PE ratios were getting way out of kilter, that there, there were bubbles, and that uh, you know, some, some sort of appropriate regulatory behavior ought to have been taken. And clearly, yeah, foreign exchange markets are not efficient. You know, I started my career as, um, as a foreign exchange trader, you know, straight out of university, I was a foreign exchange trader for two years, and I did a master's degree uh, part-time in the evenings and the, um, the dealing room at, at Citibank in the Strand then used to be in the, in the basement and I get, went up to Birkbeck College to do my part-time master's degree in the evenings and the, and the lectures were always on the fifth floor there and I, I seem to go from this sort of hellish experience, these traders doing things which shouldn't be allowed, it, well it shouldn't be allowed according to the textbook, to sort of high theory on the fifth floor at Birkbeck where I was told about market efficiency and rational expectation, I said no way this is true. Um, I've spent, you know, I wrote my PhD on, the, on, the, on, the, on, that, on that disconnect, if you like, and I've spent, uh, I've developed an academic career on looking at that. The markets are not efficient. Um, if the market, if the market's efficient, you wouldn't have um, people making money in hedge funds, for one thing, right? 
Okay, so uh, okay, so we have a gentleman at the front, and I think it's the case of okay. So there's one in the in the middle with a black jacket and white shirt, and then I think it's going, going, gone. Okay, you sir. Uh, if I could ask you a question, given um, the recent CPI and RPI results in the UK, perhaps not going down as much as expected, how would you compare the risks um, of deflation, perhaps like there was in Japan in the 1990s, compared to perhaps hyperinflation, as might happen with the revenue? Thank you, and we'll have your question, please. Okay, um, thank you for coming. Really do appreciate this talk, it's great. Um, my question is about short-term versus long-term remedies. Um, you've been talking a lot about regulation and changing um, macroeconomic policy, but these are quite long-term ideas. The stimulus package that just passed last week, um, this is trying to target short-term, but it also has a lot of long-term remedies to it. So is, it, is there really a short-term solution, or is most of the things that we need to do long-term based? And um, is there any possible way that the stimulus packages could actually foster short-term stimulation if it's okay? Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I think this is also going to be oh, your final word. Is that I, this gentleman here would like to speak if he's on? Okay, well, let's take your point and then I, I will ask the panel to have their final word as well. Okay, okay thanks. As it was mentioned earlier, uh, we seem to enter an era where we're leaving behind the politics of uh, Reagan and Thatcher, and which were lauded at the time for um, creating a boom in the economy. And we're entering into an era where, just like in the 30s with FDR, we're hoping that government now can create the boom instead of the market. Uh, does this probably mean that economists should stop focusing on creating general theories on trying to describe how the economy acts all the time, and instead of and to create uh, theories who try to describe the economy at sp certain times, at specific times? I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mark, would you like to uh, sure. um, respond and make, have your On the issue word? of um, deflation versus hyperinflation, my, my interpretation of the, uh, the RPI figures is that they're dangerously close to deflation. It was 0.1%, is that right, I think, the RPI figures? Um, you know, and that's very close to, to, you know. And you think that those, those RPI figures, RPI, price indices tend to, tend to overestimate the true rate of inflation. Why? Well, one good reason is because products actually get higher quality as you go through time. So you buy <coughs> higher quality goods for the, for, 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 for the same price, means that actually you're getting, prices are actually falling, right? So 0.1% RPI may well be a true rate of inflation that's actually negative. I think that's very dangerous. And that's, that's really the, the problem we're at now. So, you know, and I guess I'm inferring what you mean, the risk of hyperinflation, should we be printing money? And, and pursuing quantitative easing, very much yes, right? But it's not as alarming as it sounds because when financial markets are working properly, when the Bank, Bank of England reduces interest rates, it automatically expands the money supply, right? The problem is at the moment it's stuck and we can't get the money supply expanding in a natural way. So one way to do it is just to print it and go out and buy it, buy, you know, buy bonds. And while at the same time, we can actually then ease up some of this... Um, uh, this, uh, you know, try and solve some of these coordination problems in the corporate bond market as well, which I alluded to. Um, the lady over here mentioned um, the stimulus package, you know, fiscal stimulus. Um, so, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about that. I ran out of time. In the One issue is, you know, should we be, should we be um, getting into more debt? Should we be spending more, saving less at this point in time? <laughs> Because isn't that how we got here? Isn't it that we did exactly that? We spent too much, we borrowed too much, and yet we're being exhorted, if you like, to go out and spend more. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, these fiscal packages amount to the government borrowing and spending more. It, it seems sort of counterintuitive counter that we should be doing more of what actually got us into this situation. And <clears throat> I think, again, I think the, the problem is it, it, it's really this short-run, long-run issue. In the, in the long run, um, an increase in saving will be matched by an increase in investment and you'll grow faster, right? It's economic growth theory. In the short run, <coughs> there's a paradox of thrift. The paradox of thrift, again, which you know, we're all dusting off our copies of Keynes, uh, uh, straight out of Keynesian economics. The paradox of thrift says 
as, as you, uh, if you save more, if everybody collectively saves more at the same time, spending falls dramatically. Uh, and there's a, there'll, there'll, be a, there'll be a fall in output in the economy, right? So it's a, <clears throat> it's a, it's a matter of moving from sort of short-term short -term recession to long-term growth. And that's, that is a very, very tricky problem, right? So, that, so the policy prescriptions at the moment is this strong fiscal package uh, and for increase in spending are quite the opposite of what we want to be doing in the long run, where we want to bring down our levels of debt to more sustainable levels, which is going to be very difficult, and to, uh, to, 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 to increase saving. The, um, I mean, what I'm worried about, I mean, the, the uncertainty is, you know, as an economist, I'm often asked, uh, you know, when will the recession end? When will it bottom out? And, you know, I guess I would say perhaps, you know, 12, 18 months' time. But, you know, the standard error bands around that are very, very large because nothing like this has ever happened before, right? Um, you know, um, in the 19... In the 1930s, it wasn't a similar. It wasn't. It wasn't a similar kind of financial impasse, or a sim similar kind of. Uh, it was similar in many ways, but this coordination failure we have in financial markets at the moment has not been has not has not occurred before in history. Also, you know, insofar as Keynesian, Keynesian style policies, fiscal stimulus was used in the 30s, it's not clear how much that actually worked, right? How much did things like you know Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal actually get the American economy? out of recession, or how much was it the rise of fascism, the rearming of Europe and the Second World War that actually conscripted the army of the unemployed? I, su I suspect the latter, right? So we don't really know how much uh, fiscal policy works. Certainly as a fine-tuning day-to-day, month-to-month management uh, tool, it went out of, out of favor, right, many years ago, because it's, it, it's a blunt instrument. It's actually very hard to get people to, uh, to spend on public work. It's harder than you think to say, we're going to build five hospitals, right? It actually takes a long time and a lot of planning and there's a lot of slip between cup and mouth actually getting that done. The other point is, you know, what is, remember um, one of these funny, funny mechanical toys you learn about when you're learning economics, the multiplier. The multiplier is you, know, you spend, the government increases spending by 100 pounds and then the person getting that gets an extra, you know, spends an extra 50 quid and the person getting that spends an extra 25 and when you, add up, when you add up all the little bits and pieces it adds up to double what the government spend, right? right? Will that happen under, under, under the present uh, situation? Will you, what will happen when people get extra income? Will they, won't they just pay off their debt? Or won't they think, well, if, um, you know, I'm pretty sure taxes are going to go up. For some people they're going to go up next year, right? To, or the year after next, 45%. Um, it's an uncertain situation. Perhaps I should hoard this cash, right? It's not clear to me that those, those multiplier processes are going to be very strong in this environment. Um, that's why I think there are con there's a considerable amount of uncertainty around um, the efficacy of this fiscal stimulus. But we'll have to it, close it's the best thing we can possibly do. Okay. Marcus, your last word. Uh, there, there was a question about the nature of, uh, of economics. It was a fairly philosophical question, I think. The gentleman over here. Uh, I think it's, it is necessary to combine these two a aspects of economics. The sort of optimistic uh, full employment growth theory uh, scenario embedded in DSGE and the more depression type economics of Keynes. So we have to have them both, I think, for good times and bad times, if you like. And um, we're having a conference actually this summer uh, at Warwick on new foundations for macroeconomics. And the, there is a framework that does this. You mix game theory and uh, market clearing theory. And one of, the, one of the interesting things that Mark just described is how some things change sign. Some things that are good for good times are bad in, in bad times, like saving. So I think it's necessary to have a framework that accommodates uh, both of those things. Who knows, maybe this summer someone will write down the new general theory. Andrew. Um, I'm attracted to saying something about your very good question, should economists stay away from general theories? And I, I think that they should change their approach. If you ask me what is the most successful general theory of the last few hundred years, I might be inclined to say Charles Darwin's. We could argue, we could argue a bit, but that would be one of the strong contenders. Now, what was Darwin's theory driven by? It was driven by decade after decade of painstaking empirical work looking at fossils, collecting data, he wrote many books full of dull data. And economists seem to think they can construct general theories without doing the decades of painstaking regular scientific method work. And I'd like to see that change in the last bit of my lifetime. Thank you. The, uh, the last word belongs to me. Uh, I'd like to thank a number of people. 
I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your patience and your good humour. I'd like to thank our panellists for the insights that they've lent us. I'd like to thank our helpers, uh, Anna and Alex. I'm not quite sure where you've gone, but uh, thank you very much for your help. And I'd like to thank Fiona Brown, who's sitting beside me, without whom none of this would have happened, I assure you. So thank you very much, and please...